Yay. We got it. Did Donna just leave? Oh, she she's back. Oh, Her okay. internet was a little bit unstable. Okay. Yeah. And here's Alicia. Cool. Yay, ladies. I'm so excited for this night. I know. I've been thinking a lot about it. And I'm really happy that we get to do this together, Meg. Um, it was kind of fun that you and I met through a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. And we're both so silly and um, intelligent and deep thinkers. And, you know, like being able to talk about deep things without like getting monotone and boring. Like we just like light up and, and we then totally light up when we have our conversations. And it always is like, it's so inspiring for me that it just more starts coming after every time. And because we're both body workers, like, you know, like when you're, there's a magic thing that happens when you're working on another mm -hmm. body worker that like when your hands are on them and then like more comes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which Definitely. we experienced in Missouri. We did. Oh, it was so good. I dream about that sometimes. <laughs> we'll have to recreate it. It was so spontaneous. And it was like, oh gosh. And I had that thing in my neck. We just did this magical thing. And it was, it was lovely. And then we went for that walk after that. And we, and so many good ideas came to be as a result of our exchange. Yeah. We, we cleared like, like what a chiropractor would have, probably experience like when you clear all the stuff mm -hmm. it's fine and then like everything aligns mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened yeah it's so good well tell tell me so I presented this to you I said can you please please do surrender with me mm -hmm. and so you start okay so when you said that I got super excited because I love talking about this subject with my clients and I work with primarily women. Um, I, I would call myself a relationship coach. I do. Um, and I like to talk about this in the respect that surrender for me is something that means I am giving up control over the thing or I know, let me rephrase that. I know the things over which I have control. And the only thing that really is IMO, in my opinion, is me, right? So only I can only control my thoughts, how I respond to a situation. You know, like I can't control the other person with whom I'm in relationship. And so everyone that I work with and myself included what we want is this feeling of deep intimacy. We want to feel, feel deeply connected to people. We want to have, you know, we want to feel fulfilled. We want to feel satisfied. And we can only do that through working with ourselves and releasing, letting go of the things that we think we have to constantly manage, right? And so like managing other people's feelings, managing other people so that I feel okay about what I'm feeling, right? Or so that I, like we said, so that I don't have to experience an emotion, but it's so deeply gratifying when you come to the realization that there is no control outside of the self. And it's when then I can come into a very deep acceptance of me. And that, once I know that, once I experience that, once I feel that acceptance, then I can actually begin to allow myself or can begin to share myself with true authenticity, right? With someone else. Because I can't do that if I'm constantly trying to manage myself or be something that I think other people want me to be um, or control the way someone thinks about me or an opinion that someone has of me by behaving in a certain way so deep self-acceptance is is so key and i think surrender is an important piece of that so let me throw a sprocket in your clock let's <laughs> let's hear it so what if somebody's 
point of view of who they are is wrapped up in helping others. Well, that's very typical, especially, you know, for people like us, for body workers, for therapists, for coaches. And of course, I think that it's an important part of my life to help and to serve others um, just in terms of like creating a community that I want to be part of. Right. But my identity isn't intertwined with that. Right. Like whether or not someone gets the result that they want, whether or not I, I abide by this concept called the wounded healer. Are you guys all familiar with the wounded healer? And how, when we're working with others, we're really trying to heal ourselves when we have this, when we're kind of in this crisis space of where we're completely um, just caught up. And if we can't help others and we don't have any value or worth necessarily, um, or our value and worth is completely tied to someone else's wellness or um, happiness. And I believe that we're trying to heal parts of ourselves through working with people or healing that part of ourselves that's that's trying to find its value and worth, so to speak. So while helping people is absolutely a beautiful and noble thing, if it's at the expense of our own wellness, of our own well-being, or if we're sacrificing something that's very important to us, in order to, you know, feel liked, loved, approved of, you know, get that sense of esteem. Um, that's a real red flag for me and has yeah. been in the past. I think what, what think I about experienced it? when I was going through the steps in Codependence Anonymous and um, realizing that I felt like I was abandoning people mm. by not. Mm accepting the mantle, the responsibility of other mm -hmm. people's problems. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I was intric intricately intertwined mm -hmm. with other people's problems because mm -hmm. it meant I cared about them if I was willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're taught a lot of that. To a lot of, a lot of problems. Yes. Huge problems because then like that's how you're spending your time and you're judging yourself based on, you know, how available you can be for other people. And not that we don't want to be helpful to those we love or supportive, let's say, right? Like, how can I support you? But it doesn't mean that exactly what you're saying that like you take on the weight of things that are outside of you. I think I like when the word I, mantle. Yeah, I got that I was taking away people's ability to learn and have lessons on their path that their higher power set them on. Absolutely. That challenges make people who they are, you know, like otherwise yeah. they'd be total assholes. Well, yeah. <laughs> people have to learn resiliency and people have to learn coping mechanisms and people have to learn what's going to work for them without them doing exactly what I was talking about earlier and putting it outside of themselves, right? Like, well, now you have to do something about how I feel, right? Like that is what the codependent becomes. The person that does the thing to make the other person feel stable or better, or, you know, to kind of create this, it's false, this false feeling because we're doing the codependent does a dance, right? Just to make sure that everything's okay. And I agree, it robs people of the opportunity to actually have an experience that will eventually, even though they can't see it now, be helpful for them. That that made me feel a lot better when somebody must have said that to me or I read it, or it's mm -hmm. just a combination of of absorption. Mm -hmm whatever it was, um, that other people have their own road. Mm -hmm. And why would I take that from them? That mm. be, be the, um, 
enabler that keeps them inside of a box so right. that they never break out and and find that strength to become who they are meant to be. Right. It's like almost, I remember I used to have this need to be a hero. And as much as I'm going to hate to admit this to all of you, I am going to be completely vulnerable here. I used to be disappointed if people didn't have any more problems. I'd be like, oh, there's nothing. Who am I? Like, there's nothing for me to do here then, you know? And that was a real indicator to me. Like that, that is that, that's my only serve it. Like I'm just here for service, you know? And like I said, I absolutely serve others, but in relationships where I want to be close with people, I don't want to be a fixer, you know? Yeah. I think I play the role of gift giver. Oh, that I will. Yeah. There <laughs> me, me and Donna, uh, that's how I create value. So that mm-hmm. people won't leave me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a real hard one for me to, to swallow. I don't have to do that for mm-hmm. people to, to like me. Right. You know? Right. And then we're, we're really teaching people, like we're setting ourselves up almost for disaster because what if, what if then you don't have a gift to give, you know, or like, what if I don't have a solution to a problem, you know, what, and I, I'm, I'm teaching people from the get go, how to treat me. Right. And if people expect that of you from the beginning, um, then is that all I'm good for, you know, and it just perpetuates that cycle of like a false sense of, I'm still dealing with how I've taught people. They totally, I'm people treat me like Google. Kim. Hey, Kim. (laughs) But you do know a lot. Damn, damn it, I do. <laughs> Dang it. So, Shoot. But yeah, I, I do have that those moments of because I part of my behavior is I would see people having a problem on say social media. They're like, oh, mm-hmm. this is, and I'm thinking, oh, I know what I can do because I have this grandiose um thing that I know better for people. Mm. Mm-hmm. That I am, I know I have more information. I'm more intelligent than them. And clearly I know better than what they're for their own lives. Oh, totally. Like what I know is going to just, yeah, it's so much better than what they know. And they, if I could just point them in the right direction, just everything. Yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. I'm like Googling all this stuff and I'm sending it to them. And they're like either most of the time, very grateful or like, who the hell do you think you are? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, screw you. I just spent 20 minutes figuring this out. (laughs) If you don't want my information, fine. I'll find someone that does. (laughs) 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 Do you find in your business being a giver that sometimes you give too much because you want people to be part of your organization? or community. Yeah, I still have to be aware of what it what it is I'm offering and I, I think I'm getting better at showing value through just information. Mhm. Because I really don't like going to the post office. And if I offer that too much, then I become resentful. So totally. I have to become I have to remember that about myself, that when I offer something that I check in, like, do you really have time to, to offer that? It's such a good practice because I used to do that all the time too, not the post office, but I would just always be the person that raised my hand. Like, oh, I can do it. I can do it. And then I'd be like, oh, I do this. you know, but I didn't have any system in place for checking myself. And making sure that I didn't wind up in a place of resentment, Um, you know, that I didn't wind up in a space of doing things that I didn't really want to do. I, I didn't have any standards, you know, I just always wanted, I was always wanting to, to gain that approval of someone or them to like me. Oh, Meg, can you tell me your favorite way to say no in a nice way? No. (laughs) (laughs) It's 
so funny that you ask. I actually have a PDF and I could put the link to it in the chat if you guys want. And it's like 19 ways to say no. It's beautiful. And I love, like, all right, give me an example though. Like, tell me, give me an example because it would depend on what you were going to uh, okay. ask me. I, well, want, you guys give her an yeah. example. Because I feel like if I say an example, somebody I know is going to know my, <laughs> where it came from. What you're talking about. I mean, I really do like, if no one has a, a real life example, um, I really do like the idea of just saying, thanks for asking. That doesn't work for me right now. Because it's so easy, and especially if you mean thank you. If you don't mean thank you, then don't include that part. Just say, that just really doesn't work for me. No, I'm not going to be able to do that. Yeah. Because... It's just so, and you can say it with kindness, right? It doesn't have to be like, no, because I feel like we past versions of ourselves would back ourselves into a corner, into a place where I would then be like, no, oh my God. But it was because I had already said yes so many times, right? But that person doesn't know that I've been doing that. So it's also not fair to that other person to then just like explode because it's not their problem that I've said yes too many times when I didn't want to. Right. Um, and it, you know, if people feel taken advantage of, I can understand that. And that happens when we don't clearly have minimum standards or boundaries or, you know, state what does work for us or let people know that's not going to work for me. I already have too much going on. I'm already committed. You know, I'd love to, I already have plans, you know, that kind of thing. I get a lot of invitations. Um, so say somebody wants me to do a booth for them or speaking engagement or mm -hmm. do a class at their place. Mm -hmm. And I really have to check in with their values and mm -hmm. with my values mm -hmm. and um, go, no, I don't, that doesn't align that doesn't align with me. I think that's beautiful too, because it's so honest. And then you also know, like, if you're saying that doesn't align with me, that person probably isn't, if it's the person, you know, or the place, the space, you know, that you probably aren't inviting another invitation, you know, for that same, you won't have like it. Whereas if you made up an excuse, you're putting yourself in a position to just be asked again something that you don't, and then you're going to have to face it again. Whereas if we can be just very vulnerable and it's scary because we're putting our truth out there. And of course, you know, we think that we are going to be rejected if we say no to someone else, or perhaps they won't like us anymore. But if that's the case, I mean, those are all things we just kind of have to weigh. Well, is that someone with whom we really want to have a relationship? You know, if they're going to be angry that we can't just do every single thing that they want us to do for them or with I, them. I wrote down a couple of things I was reading about um, that factors that impede our surrender. Mm, okay, and let's hear it. I mentioned one of them, which was the grandiose. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually like a, I think it actually has like a whole syndrome that goes with it. I could see that. And I believe that it is a real issue because I think people have a need to feel important. And that's, you know- or or they don't want to come like, so for example, like, because I'm an alcoholic and I would, you know, go to an AA meeting, mm -hmm. there's a, every walk of life in that room. Mm -hmm. You're looking for similarities. You're not looking for differences. Yeah. But the first impulse, you know, so say like half the people in the room are court ordered, you know, our education levels are going to be very different. Yeah. I'd easily be like, I don't belong here. Mm-hmm. You know, who, who do these, pe these people don't have anything to give me mm. that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm automatically putting myself here mm -hmm. and I'm not saying no, actually there's, we have the exact same value as humans, mm -hmm. like no matter right. my stance or education or, or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. like we're just the same mm -hmm. <laughs> and remembering that. Um, and then the other piece that I was reading about was defiance. Mm. that's all the denial being wrapped up in denial. And I think between you and I and codependency and 
it's super easy to for us to justify when we have intentions of helping others. Mm-hmm. Well, I did it because, mm-hmm. you know, this and this and this and this. Um, so I think until people have an understanding of the laundry list of what a codependent looks like mm-hmm. or you know, before for a person understands recovery, it's, I'm not talking just about, you know, um, substance abuse, right. Impulsive behaviors. I'm talking about like, there's an entire family tree of addictions. There's, um, thinking obsession and emotional obsession and, mm-hmm. um, shopping obsession, you know, diff- totally. Yes. Whole yes. Not thing. just substance abuse. Mm-hmm. And the, the biggest factor I think is, is having that understanding of, of what it looks like. When I read the laundry list, I was like, oh, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Now, oh, do you have that book? The green one? I think Shannon, you've got it, huh? The the codependence anonymous one. Yes, I do. Let me grab it really quick. Is it? Oh, you know what? I probably got it on PDF right here. Oh yeah. Then you yeah. Don't have, have you looked at it before, Meg? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It's quite shocking. I'm wondering if I've got it in here. File, open file. let's see if it's in here otherwise i'll just grab my book can i have that facial tension pdf that you just scrolled past? yeah i will i will did it, um, take you ladies to realize that you were trying to gift gift things because you wanted people to like you or say yes because you want to get people to like you like when did you discover like, wait a minute, although this seems like a genuine thing I'm doing, I'm really trying to please this person or I'm really wanting acceptance from this person. Like, um, after I was divorced, I realized it and mm -hmm. I realized the way I would do it with my mom. And I realized the way I would do it with my in-laws I mean, I loved them. I loved these people so much when I was like, when I was married, I loved my, my husband's family so much. And, um, it wasn't evident, you know, it wasn't things that were like, oh my gosh, she's a total weirdo. But when looking back on it, it was like, I would do all the things and like make all the food for all the holidays you know, and wouldn't, and would be like super resentful of other people that wouldn't do it. But I was looking back on it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was just looking for them to say like, she's the best. She, you know, she does such a good job. We love everything that she does. And of course I want to belong to this family. Right. And I want to offer something that's valuable, but it doesn't have to be such an extreme. That is what made me realize it. Right. was like, the extreme lengths to which I would go, um, like an inability to tell my mom that she couldn't come over to my house at certain times, or like an inability to have a conversation with her about when it was a good time for her to come over and when wasn't like that. It wasn't okay for me to have a boundary there as a 40 year old woman. I mean, those were all very, they were shocking to me. They were very shocking. I found that answer. I just pulled a poster off of my wall. Can I share Mm -hmm. it with you? Huh? Yeah. This was by Lisa Turker and her book, The Best Yes. And I've actually had it on my wall since 2014. And it's 10 ways to graciously say no when you feel pressured to say yes. Oh, nice. And on a personal aspect, it says, while my heart wants to say yes, 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 the reality of my time makes this a no. Oh, Number two, I am honored by your request, but I'm in a season of refocusing my priorities and have not committed to, and have committed not to add anything new right now. Number three, after living an unhealthy breakneck pace for too long, 
I'm learning to realistically access my capacity. Though I would love to say yes, the reality of my limitations means I must say no at this time. Number four, I so appreciate you asking me, but I must be brave and decline this opportunity. Saying no is hard for me, but necessary in the season. Thank you for understanding. And number five, I promise my family not to add any new commitments to my schedule right now. Thank you for our friendship that allows me to be honest with my realities. Oh, I and, like then on, and then on a professional note, it says, thank you for thinking of me. Your project sounds wonderful. However, as much as I would love to be involved, I can't give your project the attention it deserves right now. While I would love to connect with your new project, I've discovered that this, this is one of those activities I must give up while trying to blank, like such as write my book, start my business, stick to my project. Saying yes would just enable my unhealthy habit of procrastination. Thank you for mm. understanding and helping me push through to the finish line. Next one is, there is nothing more that I love than helping others in my field get started. Unfortunately, I have so many requests for this that I'm no longer able to meet in person. So I've, a cre I've created this attached document with my best advice. And it says create a PDF, for instance, like this. So you only have to type out your own advice one time. The next one, while I don't have time for a lunch appointment, I'd love to connect for a few minutes over the phone. I can talk to you from 8 to 8.30 a.m. Yes, and the last that's one, so good. Thank you so much for caring enough about me to want my involvement. Unfortunately, I am not able to participate at this time, but I'm certainly cheering for your continued success. I love it, Thank Donna. You. Thank you for sharing. I definitely think um, having the proper boundary boundaries and awareness to what we're capable of um, and being able to say no will keep our keep our cup from going dry mm -hmm. with with things like resentment. Yeah, and like your keep your cup from going dry is such a great way to put it because we we only have so much to give. And we have to make sure that we're giving to ourselves and taking care of ourselves so that we can give from a place of truly wanting to and having the ability to with grace, right? Not from a place of, of sadness or overwhelm or overcommitment. Yeah. Or I mean, our identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Like I have to, I should, I really should. I put the link in the chat too of the 19 ways to say no. Thanks. Well, I pulled, can you guys see this? The patterns and characteristics. Mm -hmm. I pulled it up um, to answer your, some of your questions, Shannon, um, of like, how do you know in each relationship? I think mm -hmm. when you truly understand these documented behaviors and when they show themselves in our relationships so that we can be more aware of what's going on with you before you respond to mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it keeps me really humble and in recovery when I'm, when I have those awarenesses, I, I, I try to congratulate myself like, Oh, I caught it mm -hmm. before it got weird. Um, mm -hmm. And it helps me stay connected to my higher power because I, I know that without me having gone through what I went through, I wouldn't have even bother with any of this yeah and I, I could have woke up you know my mother's age and been like I don't even know what I like for me because all I've done is cared about others because exactly because all I've done is care about others and what others need and what others want and what others expect of me and it is it does lead to a, a good indication for me to answer Shannon's question a little bit further is I wouldn't know what I wanted. Like people would be like, well, what do you want to do? And I'd be like, what? You know, like, I, I don't know. Or what do you like? Like, what do you like for someone to do in a relationship? What's important for you? I, I don't yeah. really know. If we've always, I, I mean, I do, but I did Around each group of people we're around. Precisely. To avoid, to avoid criticism and pain. Mm-hmm. So this is so we can 
show up as who we really are by identifying these things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we become who we're supposed to, and it becomes easier and easier um, to have healthy relationships and be able to connect. Yeah. To be able to connect. And then you, you, we can't connect from a place of trying to always fulfill the needs of others. It's just impossible because we aren't, of course, then I wouldn't feel fulfilled. I wouldn't feel fulfilled if I'm just always filling the buckets of other people, but I hadn't taken the time to recognize what is important for me. You know, what I do want, what, what things do bring me joy. What am I looking for in a partner? What am I looking for in a relationship? What am I looking for in a friendship, in a business partner? You know, like until I identified those things, I'm just kind of like stumbling like a fawn, you know, like going through all the motions and in every place and just almost, I mean, it, it it's kind of crazy, like how I would get this revving engine inside myself, right? Like, like I have to do something. I have to go somewhere. I have to be something for someone else. And it kept me going. Absolutely. Um, but I hadn't taken the time to just be in myself and figure myself out outside of all the external circumstances and external perceptions of who I was or was supposed to be. I have this vision of my mother, my mother at like a Thanksgiving party mm-hmm. and she's chewing gum and she's mm-hmm. simultaneously has a wet rag in her hand. Oh. And she's like, making sure what is it that I can do to make everybody else comfortable totally like being being the hostess in every situation so not just Thanksgiving mm-hmm. if people in the room are not okay then she cannot be okay totally and I think that that is a very to me, strong working definition of a codependent I'm not okay if you're not okay or I'm only okay if you're okay yeah So let's look at just quickly some of these patterns and I can just send this off to you guys to look at later. Um, I'm sure you were looking at it as we were talking, the denial patterns, um, low self-esteem patterns, um, compliance patterns, um, extremely loyal remaining in harmful situations too long, compromise their own values and integrity to avoid rejection or anger, Mm -hmm. put aside their own interests in order to do what others want hypervigilant regarding the feelings of others and take on those feelings. Um, that's a big one for me. Me too. That's a sexual attention when they want love. That was like every. <laughs> that was a really big one for me. It was super huge for me in like my young adulthood and even my teenage years. And it's something that I'm just healing from now. And it's been a really powerful healing for me to recognize that I did that um, because I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted that. I didn't know how else to get love, you know, from a male. And so I would just, I knew that that worked. And so it was, it, it satisfied in some way, the attention, you know, the need for or the desire for attention, but it was not at all that deep heartfelt connection that I was seeking. Yeah. I I think that's a big one for a lot of people, especially it feeds into victim mentality Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Mm self-esteem, um, control patterns, um, lavish gifts and favors on those who want to influence. (laughs) Look at the top one. People (laughs) believe people are incapable of taking care of themselves. (laughs) There's the grandiose thing. Attempt to convince others what to think, do, or feel. Mm. My mom. Uh, freely offer advice and direction without being asked. There's there's me. <laughs> there, It's yeah. all over. Any of us can read this and go, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. The, the ability to take responsibility for your own shit is amazing. Because then you're, you don't have to play this game of yes. blame. Yes, because the blame game always gives someone else the control. Like, well, if it's someone else's fault that I'm angry or sad or whatever, then it's also up to them to make me happy or to feel good. Um, 
And of course, I am allowed to have any emotion I want in response to what someone does or says. However, I don't have to allow that to dictate my feelings about myself. You know, like I I get to choose. I think that that's where, you know, surrender is so powerful. I surrender to the fact that I cannot control what's outside of me. And I can choose at every moment in my life, I can choose for me. That's a really, a really good one that I can't control what other people think about me. Mm -hmm. Ever. Yep. And wondering what other people think about me becomes that's like when we're talking about like the obsessive thinking almost too, you know, like you're obsessively thinking about what someone else is thinking after, well, we had this altercation and well, now are they mad at me? Are they going to, what if she's, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, it can become just this spiral, this cycle, and it serves certainly not me and definitely not the other person. Like, what's the story I'm telling myself about why that that's even, why that's even a good or helpful or beneficial behavior. Yeah. That in one of my meetings, I think I sent it to you, the notes on it. It was called catastrophizing. Mm, mm -hmm. Where did that go? Mm -hmm. I have it right here. Um, oh, here it is. The, it was in the yoga recovery meeting yeah. and talking about the kleshas. Right. Yeah clinging to the repetitive catastrophizing or ruminations over my fears um fears and fears and lack of self-reliance and self-confidence um so what i thought was interesting about that and how i think it relates to surrender is we're keeping we're keeping the instead of saying okay god you know better than i do or whoever you call your higher power, if it's, if it's nature, if it's the universe, if it's the space between time, the space between objects, air, anything larger than yourself, it's saying, you know, I, I recognize that whatever it is that my little tiny human brain is thinking is so much bigger at the picture. I'm not mm -hmm. able to see the bigger picture. So I'm going to need help on this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and part of the prefrontal cortex, when we get stuck in that dopamine loop, yeah. Um, it's, it keeps us in the short term, right? So where panic lives mm -hmm. is when we're like, it's never going to change. I'm going to feel like this forever. Right. right. And it's being able to have that perspective of the, of the whole, like it, like the two hour movie. Mm -hmm. mm. not mm -hmm. just the part where somebody gets murdered in the tower. yes yeah like right the whole thing like with the plays out to the end like they didn't get murdered they're an actor <laughs> <laughs> it was corn syrup the whole time <laughs> i like that i i like what you're saying though about the you know we just get these blinders on and this narrow sort of tunnel vision that it's this way and there's no other there's no other possibility it shows up in my business a lot and mm. where I have an idea of how I want something to go and I want it to be this certain way so maybe like so like my coaching program that's starting in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. I'm like I want 12 people Mm -hmm. why does it have to be just 12 mm -hmm. what if there's more people that need help mm -hmm. so I'm like okay so I'm not going to put boundaries on things that don't need to have boundaries on things I'm telling yeah. myself oh Kim like you're what you're doing isn't good enough so like let's even just see if we can get this because obviously you know so that's the part of my brain that's yeah, that underlying that belief mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I don't trust that the work that I've put will bear fruit. So right. a lot of times I end up dropping the ball pretty close to when a project is done because I'm like, see, look, it proves I, I couldn't do it right. I used to have that habit too. 
and just yeah. like oh I'd be like 90 percent of the way and just yeah well it's probably not going to turn out anyway so yeah well I to me what I've shifted about. lately is that faith and trust mm -hmm. in my higher power and that surrender of like well I did the work so now I'm gonna leave it to you yeah and, and I just not having to necessarily know the how of, yeah. of it happening right or the attachment to my worth or my identity again as a result of the like my worth isn't attached to the outcome you know oh yeah that's a big one mm -hmm. that's a huge one so I'll save this for you guys um if you'd like me to share it with you but I'll stop sharing I love that. Yeah. Thank you. And then I have some questions. I'll type them in the chat if you guys want, but I wrote down some questions that I have found to be beneficial for me in terms of like coming to a place where I can have more acceptance and can surrender. Um, and one of them is what am I afraid of and what am I afraid to feel? Cause that's a big one. Like, am I afraid to feel anger? Am I afraid to feel disappointment? Am I afraid to feel uh, committed? Am I afraid to feel joy? And the reason that this was an important question for me to figure out is because I learned that like, if I'm afraid to feel, then I'm controlling others and the external circumstances in order to control my own emotions so that I don't have to experience a feeling, right? So that it, I'm kind of manipulating others in order to avoid a certain feeling. So it's what am I afraid of? And then what am I afraid to feel? Mm -hmm. And then um, another one that I like is what is unfulfilled in me? And with that, I, I start saying like, where am I attempting to get something met through an external means like what's that original wound you know that that leaves me with an inability to get that need met or to get that feeling fulfilled or to feel fulfilled because I'm afraid of I'm, I'm afraid of what the outcome will be I'm afraid to ask for it I think it's somehow bad it's been told to me that it might be selfish or unkind or wrong um and so, you know, what's the original wound that leaves me in a place where I cannot feel fulfilled or I don't allow myself to feel fulfilled? And that usually stems from a judgment that I've made about myself. So I also like that one. What mm -hmm. judgments do I have about myself? And that I also then project onto others because that creates a distrust then like between myself and someone else and an inability to see people really for who they are or what they think of me because I've already made a judgment about me I project that judgment onto someone else and then I'm determined like I just have convinced myself that they think the same thing or have the same judgment about me that I have about me does that make sense yeah does it make sense to anyone else <laughs> I'm just writing down the questions. Yeah. If you guys want, I can just type them in the chat. Yeah, please yeah. do. Okay. I like that a lot. I actually have an entire yoga sequence for surrendering. Ooh. So I am going to email that out to you guys. So I've written the notes of everything we've talked about, and then I'll put it so that you have everything. Thanks, Kim. And we'll put your. I, just, I emailed you the um, the poster that I read. Oh, thank you. I'll include that. I appreciate that, Donna. Patterns and characteristics, and then we want the yoga sequence and the questions. 
And then uh, the, the oils that I used for surrendering in the 12 step book that I put together, I think, I believe it was Neroli and Aroma Touch. And I'm sure I've told you guys about that. Um, at the time that I was really struggling with giving over control of the my will and my life to God, mm -hmm. I had an understanding of God, but I didn't have a personal relationship with my spirituality and feeling those synchronicities in life. And, um, you know, that somebody was looking out for me, be that whatever it is, um, I was using a lot of neroli, a lot. <laughs> and that really just helped me get through those times. So I'd love to hear if you guys have holistic tools that have really supported you, like movement. I know Shannon does Tai Chi, oh, uh, nice. journaling. If you guys want to share, we can we can write that in the list of things that bring you to that connection, that place with your higher power. Um, for me, it's an, I have to be in water. It's like the easiest place for me to connect in prayer. Yeah. I was just going to say a bath, like t making time to mm -hmm. take a bath or like putting oils in there. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as like connecting to a higher power, like being in nature for sure, or even like near water like an ocean or a lake or um yeah sometimes I'll just literally go like lean against a tree and and be like okay I feel supported I feel connected does the Shinrin Ryuko help you with that Alicia yes the new for thing. sure I have it diffusing right now and Which one? the Shinrin Yoku it's oh, the new forest bathing blend nice yeah um I've been using that one a lot um especially since I'm in the desert but I'm not really a desert person it's been really helpful for me because I miss the trees so that one has been really comforting to me he's from yeah, wandering, on the beach, wandering on the beach with the ponies is my thing <laughs> that sounds so nice Oh my gosh, that sounds so nice. Love those tax exempt ponies <laughs> in Delaware. <laughs> no, she's in Maryland. No, I know. <laughs> Actually, the island is split between Maryland and Virginia. Oh. And, and there's two separate herds of the Shinkatig ponies. There are the Assetig ponies that are in the in the strip of land. And in Virginia, the fire department controls the wild ponies. Mm -hmm. And once a year in July, they swim the ponies across the channel and they auction off a certain number of them to um, control the herd. So when my dad was little, my grandfather had taken a raffle ticket on one of the ponies and he won it. And so he had to go pick up this pony. So he put it in the, he took the seat out of the car and brought the pony home in the car. <laughs> but if you ever, oh um, if you ever read the book, Misty Shinkatig, that's all about the, um, the Assetig ponies. Shinkatig. So cute. In Hesperia, you are legally allowed to have a pony as a pet in the library. Stop it. You can have a pony as a support animal. Oh, How about a cat. <laughs> she just jumped up on my lap because she heard us talking that? about ponies. <laughs> She's like, you don't need a pony. You have me. I'm here and I love you. And I'm going to sit on your lap just to prove it. <laughs> he looks like he has mittens on. Look at how cute she is. This is Coco. Hi, Coco. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> She has such a bratty look on her face right now. She's like, why are you doing like, that to me? She's <laughs> like, I just want to sit down. <laughs> um, okay, so I also wrote down some oils that I love um that help me through, you know, or help me that elicit certain feelings in me, certain states. And I love, 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 love geranium. 
for its heart energy. I feel like it's a very, um, like whenever I put it on, I do put it specifically over my heart and I put it on the back of my neck and then I'm like, mm, and I wear it almost daily. Um, but it's like, it's very healing for me. It's a very like gentle heart energy healing oil. And I always feel this beautiful connection to myself when I, whenever I use it and like to that, to that gentle feeling, it kind of that. And I also like balance balance helps me get out of like that. Go, 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 go. You know, like I gotta, I gotta go. It helps me just kind of come into the, into the now and be present. I like that. I feel like we need a whole worksheet on connection to self. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oils and connection to self. Yeah, so I you- like I like the new blue lotus, and I like the story of coming out of the muck and coming out to be a like a beautiful flower with no muck on it, and that's that's just that kind of you know relates to my life. <laughs> I don't have that one. You're missing out, Meg. I think I remember you posting about it. I'm gonna put it in my next order. It's like I've gone, this is actually my like almost gone bottle. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to forget it in my office, the full bottles in my bathroom. <laughs> I've used it all over my face like twice a day. It's like, For what? So, uh, it, it works with like um, dark circles and mm-hmm. spots mm-hmm. and it has a naturally occurring squalene mm-hmm. and that's the stuff that balances your pH and moisture. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this is like my, my beauty oil, but it makes me feel really good. And Donna, what do you like it for? Or do you just like the story? I I like, well, I I really like the story that I can connect to, but Mm -hmm. it just, it's just like a calming, you know, just like a Mm. gentle, like a relaxing kind of feeling when I use it. Okay. So, um. And it's weird because I had a girlfriend come over and she smelled it the other day and she couldn't smell anything. She, I mean, it, she had no reaction to it at all. Interesting. So, so I guess, you know, different people are going to react to it in different ways. Yeah. To everything. Right. I mean, to every smell I'm, I I'm love. Like, this is just wonderful. You need to, <laughs> you need to love this. <laughs> and you need it. Just get it. I mean, come yeah. on. <laughs> well, it's a really I subtle need, smell. You need more information it, to understand like how good it is, you know? Like mm. if you showed someone your merino wool underwear and they didn't mm-hmm. know what merino wool is, yeah, they're just moisture like, wicking and antibacterial, an antimicrobial. That means it won't smell naturally. I have hippie <laughs> friends that wear a lot of wool, mm-hmm. like my friend that she like wears a, a wool dress the entire summer, like the same one. Mm-hmm. So it's not that antimicrobial. <laughs> uh, you do have to replace them from time to time. You have to wash it. <laughs> totally. Uh, Blue um, Lotus is for awakening. That's what I was just oh, getting ready to look at. The well, yeah. perfect. Of untapped spiritual possibilities. Oh my gosh. I need the Blue Lotus in my life. Yeah. Can, it has can you really send me a picture of that, please? Yeah. I can okay. add it to the email that goes out to you guys. I was going to say to one of the words that they used during convention about the blue Lotus was emerging. And I liked that a lot too. Mm -hmm. That was really like personal to me because that's kind of, that relates to where I am. I feel like I am emerging out of something in this Mm -hmm. process of like creating my own business and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, on this wellness journey that I'm on, it's yeah. So um, I've been, using it every night before I go to bed on my face Mm. but I want to experience it more emotionally as well I think all of us are in this space of emerging right or else I don't think we'd be here I don't think we'd be (laughs) on a call like this I don't think we'd you know but I think it's so great that you have the awareness Alicia that Mm. you are like that it's a desired state for you right that I Mm. want to be emerging that I want to be awakening that I want to be accepting and evolving and transforming into this new version of myself. That's a beautiful place to be. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah. And I also think for me, 
it's emerging to be my own self and not being what everybody's mm -hmm. trying to cookie cutter what yes. I should be doing and you know what my business should look like and what my life should look like and absolutely it's it's like the more awareness we have it easier it is for us to recognize the situation and hand mm -hmm. it back over to God yes and the other person right yeah. so like one teacher that I worked with talked about this in a way that was like she used to carry other people's baggage for them, right? Like if someone had anxiety, she would carry the anxiety for them and like try to do all the things about the anxiety and not make them have the anxiety or, you know, whatever that was or the sadness. And instead she's like, now I just say here, this bag is yours, but how can I support you in that? Right? Like how, what do you need that isn't necessarily like, I don't have to become the doer for you, right? Like you get to be the doer, but how can I support you in your doing? Um, you know, like if someone has anxiety about me and uh, I'll give you a, a brief example, like my daughter likes to leave early for things and I'm fine leaving like right on time. But if she has anxiety about it, it doesn't mean that I have to hurry and scurry and like become all flustered and clustered, right? Like I just get to say, well, it's okay. You can feel that way if you want to, but I'll leave at seven 30 when I said we were going to leave, you know, like not discounting or discarding that, but just saying that I'm, that there's not like that. I haven't done anything right. Like wrong. Um, and so I'm doing my part in our relationship to show up in a way that is supportive without being having that codependent tendency of saying like okay you're anxious well then that means that I should probably like go and do this thing and we'll leave whenever you want anytime you want to you know Just because that's like that creating that cycle that pattern that dynamic of I'm going to do whatever it takes in order for you instead of allowing as you had mentioned earlier Kim for her to find a way to say like okay, I'm just feeling anxious right now. Like everything's going to be all right. We're going to leave at seven 30. You know, it's, it's very interesting, but I like the analogy of handing the baggage back and supporting. Here's your I bag. love that your daughter is not going to be an entitled jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know that, but <laughs> I hope not. I really don't think so. It sounds like you're, you're, you're raising, you know, aware people mm -hmm. and you're acknowledging her feelings, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's like it's okay. Not like, oh, you're being crazy. Just wait till seven 30. Yeah, you're like, exactly. Oh, be quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that is so key. That's been such an important step for me in all my important relationships. Um, acknowledging that people do have feelings and that it's okay and then it doesn't mean that I have to feel badly or do anything about their feelings that they don't necessarily want to have, right? Because people are constantly trying to pass off their feelings to us or make us responsible for their feelings. And a very first, very crucial step, an essential step in this process is realizing they can have their feelings and that we don't necessarily have to do anything about it. But acknowledging it is, but I do want to feel connected to my daughter, right? I do want to feel connected to my partner. I do want to feel connected to my friends. So being like, oh my gosh, I imagine that really sucks that you feel that way. Or I'm sure that's hard, you know, or that is probably really, you know, just trying to relate and have some sort of empathy, but then also knowing that there's nothing, if they don't choose to do something, there's really nothing that I can do either because it will just perpetuate that same kind of thing. This conversation is is so, so helpful. Uh, just listening to the different stories and the scenarios. I remember at the beginning, you mentioned, someone mentioned, like, if I don't have anyone to fix, like, what am I going to do? Like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at that, you know, I'm feeling that way, but it feels good and liberating because, you know, I'm just me. Like I just show up and do me and then other people observe 
and they're like, wow. But instead of me, okay, this is what you do. I just exist and, and celebrate myself and smile and that's it. <laughs> So I was just curious as far as like now that you, everyone is understanding that it's okay that people are okay. And now do we just live this free life now? You know, do we just exist and enjoy life? Cause I'm, I'm butchering the steps, Kim, but I think one of the later steps talks about like, now that we've discovered this, we're going to pass the message on, you know, you know, and that's kind of where I'm coming, like, just just existing and living a free, fulfilling life and letting that light shine instead of feeling like I have to, you know. So it's just that thin line between wanting to share based on what you've learned, but at the same time, just wanting to live and letting people just see your light. I, I, I think that that's the best. Oh, go on. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, go on. Well, I mean, you become aware, but you still come up against new situations and new relationships. And you're just more equipped to deal with it so that you can do it compassionately and kindly and get your needs met and make sure that you're honoring the other person's needs. Mm -hmm. You know, it it's... um. And I love that I have friendships and partnerships like that, that I don't have to be like worried about something and, and the relationships that still existed, that that's not possible because the other person hasn't done any of the work. Can you hold on or I'm going to excuse oh, myself yeah. for one second. Thanks. Yeah, you're fine. Um, they, you know, they're not in my life now. They're falling away. You know? So it's same you know, here. Yeah. We're inviting in. We know exactly what we want in our life now. We know where we're going. Um, we know our goals. We know who we are. So the right kind of people show up. They're going to go along for the ride because now we're not people pleasing. We're not hiding anything about ourselves to morph to other people's what they think we should be like. So the wrong people are going away and the right people are showing up. That's what I've found through this experience. And it makes me feel even closer to my higher power because it feels like people are gifts. Like these, oh, like this person. And they just add value and, and, and richness to my life because it feels like God wants me to be happy. <laughs> like, you know, here's a new friend. <laughs> I just, as I'm hopping back in here and I hear you say people as gifts, going back to the stories that I was telling earlier, those moments have been gifts for me where I realized that I was behaving in a way that isn't actually serving me or the other person. Like, I think it is, right? Like, I think I'm doing all this good for people, but it's really detrimental for me but also for them, you know, like imagine if I didn't allow that person to learn how to manage their own feelings. That's wow. Wow. It's such a gift. Like where it might seem like a struggle or something that we resist because we're afraid of what the outcome might be. That's when we get to say like, okay, I'm going to surrender and, and know that this isn't necessarily in my control. I'm going to say, okay, there's, there's a reason that this is happening here and I get to learn something and the other person gets to learn something too. So, uh, next Thursday, we're going to be going over blowing up, blowing up energy. What do you mean by that? Like when we feel like we're going to blow up? No, like when you've got so many things on your plate and all of a sudden you don't want to do any of them and slightly want to give up. Like if I died right now, I think I'd be okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was me last week. Yes. I'm yeah. just going to lay down on the carpet. That sounds good. It's the ability to say, you know what? I am going to let it all go and I'm just going to blow up my life for whatever it is right now. And none of those things I'm going to do. I'm just not going to do any of them. Mm -hmm. and be okay with it you know 
Like if you get to the feeling like this happens to me, it used to happen to me quite often in my, cause I was a binge drinker. Mm -hmm. So I peep, that's why people didn't know I was an alcoholic. Cause I would drink for just a little bit. So six weeks, eight weeks, I'd be sober. I'd be on fire. I'd be doing all this amazing things in my business. And I lived in this, um, what is that energy where it's joy and ec- ecstatic, but then it becomes like, ah, what manic. is that? Manic. manic? Mm-hmm. So I lived manically mm-hmm. and then I would get so overwhelmed that I didn't know what to do with it. Cause now I've over committed myself. I've said yes to everything. Um, and I, now I want to die. <laughs> so I would and drink now. Coffee. I can't possibly do all the things that I said I was going to do. And I'm going to let everybody down and no one's going to like me and they're going to see me for the fraud. I am <laughs> like, that was the thing. And I mm-hmm. go, so then I call it the fuck it meter. I'm like, mm-hmm. we have reached fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> So in the spirit of that, what I learned with Carla McClellan and on her list of emotions, she actually hasn't listed the suicidal urge. And I never actually was like, oh, I would have committed suicide, but it's that energy of blow it up. Mm -hmm. And I think we can allow ourselves to do that without actually like going off into like, now I'm going to go on a $2,000 shopping spree or now I'm you know, going to cut everybody off and not talk to anyone for two weeks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to become that it can. Yeah. It doesn't have to be so extreme. Yeah. So that's Mm kind of what we want to go over next week. Um, cause Meg and I have decided to partner on doing some coaching together and creating a membership so that people can get that continued support that they're really looking for. I'm so excited about it. Yeah. So that's our next topic. So we'll send out the invites. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. Love you guys. Love you too. too. Thank this you. was great. Mm-hmm. We'll see yeah. you guys next week. See you next see week. You let all let all your people know that that's that we'll be here talking. We'll do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. It was great meeting meeting you, Meg. You too, Donna. Thanks very much. And thanks for all the info about the Blue Lotus. I'm so excited. (laughs) Have a good Good night. night.